Good day to you. We know the Palm Sunday has caught the imagination of many people. It is alive in the hearts of children who would wave palm branches or young coconut leaves are made into a cross. Why has the Palm Sunday attracted so much enthusiasm and caught the imagination of many people? This was the day the Lord Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem for the last time. So there was agony and ecstasy, like in the story of Leonardo da Vinci. The ecstasy was that the humble poor believing on that particular Sunday, the last Sunday he was on earth, rejoiced that this humble king was coming on a mule. And that was according to an ancient prophecy by Zechariah the prophet who lived in 500 BC, he had said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Uh, so it was particularly remembered by people that this is an unusual king. Normally kings come for war on a horse, but this king comes on a mule and he's described as just and having salvation, humble and mounted. Out of this prediction came forth also a parallel psalm, that is Psalm 118, which has the horse and now cry. So, Palm Sunday is associated with this Hosanna sound and with palm branches and the memory of a king who came on a humble mule. So what does Hosanna mean? It comes from Psalm 118, 25 to 27. O oh Lord, do save now. There was an urgency. We beseech you, O oh Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. So God can prosper only that which he has saved. If not, our greed will ask for prosperity. So we live in a time there are many versions of gospel of Christ being propagated, especially through the electronic media, and people are bewildered. How is it that who, the king who came on a little donkey, so humbly serving, has got portrayed as one who would serve greed and prosperity. It's a dichotomy. It's a contradiction. Our own conscience and understanding says that this is not how the Lord Jesus Christ came. This is not how he would be remembered. So this psalm takes us back to the very root of the value of the gospel. And this was the psalm people sang to their king, save now send prosperity. So it was both that the king will be saved and that the king would be considerate to the people. It is from this great psalm that England got God saved the king. Also, this is what the king would say of the people, for the people, save now and send prosperity to them. So it was a reciprocal relationship of king as senior brother and people as younger brothers, so to say, benefiting from the benefactor, the king. And it is into this setting that the Lord Jesus comes as the Messiah, fulfilling this psalm. This psalm also said in Psalm 118 and verse 24, the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Always it was in the mind of Israel's greatest king to build a temple for God. Then God told him, Oh David, it's a good idea, but I cannot be contained in a temple. However, God had an idea that he will build a house, not with brick and stone, not with limestone, not with concrete structures, build a house where he lives in the heart of people who worship him. So this process began when God himself came incarnate, the one true creator God came incarnate as the Lord Jesus Christ, the little babe of Bethlehem. 
and then with him giving his life for us. He lived 33 years, 33 and a half years, sinless, perfect on earth, and then he went on the cross, and he rose again after giving his life. He died and rose again. That's the Christian gospel. And he then became the first cornerstone for this house God will build, not with dead stones, but with living stones. That is the context in which the Lord Jesus Christ said, if you ask me to stop these children crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We got children and youth that they got on the road and they saw a different leader, a humble leader, approachable, touchable among the people, no bodyguards. Jesus had no bodyguards. So if any one wants bodyguards while he is preaching the gospel, that was not like the Lord Jesus Christ. He was very approachable, he was touchable. So young people who normally wait for a revolution thought this is the revolution they were waiting for. A leader is coming who is very close at hand. And this particularly accentuated when Mark 20, Matthew 21 records, he came into the temple and he found buying and selling. And there were a whole lot of sick people, blind and lame. Because at feast time, these sick people come hoping to get healed. And the priests would charge enormous amounts that they will be in the front seats or near, that they can enter rituals. And they had charges depending on their sickness, depending on their need, charging them money. And so they earned a lot from the sick people, just like the medical industry today, pharmaceuticals, uh, laboratory investigations, uh, doctors themselves earn a lot from sick people. Now, in the olden days, when sick people uh, tried religious help, this is what happened when they came into the temple. Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one thing. And he cleansed the temple because there were so many poor people in the temple. And he said, surely all these poor people should be, uh, should be healed. He said, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord. And not only that, he whipped and threw out all the tables. And uh, they were, the priests were very upset. But this is how it happened. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But you are asking, you are making it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them all. So in religious places, the blind and the lame and the sick bring in a lot of business because people come hoping some God will touch and heal them. They bring money, they bring offering, they make covenants, we will give you so much if we are healed. And what did the Lord Jesus do? He immediately stopped the business by healing all of them at once. And the religious hierarchy got very offended because their business was over. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done, and when young people saw here is a king, he is beginning a revolution, he is with the common man and the children who were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They became indignant and save us now, they said, they thought the chance has come for them to have a righteous, humble leader, a king who is touchable, who is for them, not living on the people. They thought this is their day. That was the ex ecstasy, but the agony was that this would be short-lived and the religious hierarchy and the political leaders will connive together to kill him, crucify him, just in a few days more. But it had to be that. The king had to first give his life for the populace. This is an unusual kingdom. It is a kingdom where the king dies for the people. Usually you hear that people go and die for the king in army or war. But here is a king who gave his life for the people. 
that is Good Friday that is coming. So we will have a broadcast on Good Friday also. And then on Easter Sunday, the same king who gave his life took back that life and came alive. There will be a broadcast on Easter Sunday also for you to understand the archaeology, history, the science of how a person dies on the cross. It's, called, it's a medical condition called cardiac tamponade. Listen earnestly for that explanation. I'm Dr. Lalit Mendes, and there are many scientific and re reason and scripture talks I have given. This is the 549th. If you want any of this, please send me a WhatsApp 2074211511. If you are from abroad, plus 94-7421111. Also, you can have my app downloaded without any charges, Golden Nuggets. You can download it from App Store or from Google. So here we see a king beginning a revolution, giving a taste to the young what it would be when he is king. But he had to die. And he said, I laid my down my life, but I come again to take my life, my resurrected life in you. John 10, 17. So it is up to us now to say, Yes, Lord Jesus, you are the king I have been looking for, teaching me humility. And he said, Come unto me, ye that are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Learn of me. I am meek and lowly. Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is light, and my, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You can have this king coming into you. That's why he had to die. And his death was his visa into our life. And his resurrection is his power. Now can be evident. And we can say, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. A little more, it, uh, the agony part of it, he knew this triumph would be short-lived. He had to go to the cross to have a triumph that will be long-lasting. When he would be truly the king in the hearts of his people, who really want salvation, who really want mercy to triumph over justice. You know what that means? When we do wrong, we say, mercy, mercy, pardon me. When others do wrong, we say, justice, justice. And trust teaches us, mercy triumphs over justice. So Luke 19 has this statement of the Lord Jesus coming to Jerusalem for the last time. And this is what he says. This is what he says. And people said, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This, you will recall, is quite similar to the Christmas proclamation. Glory in the highest and peace on earth because of Him. Because He makes, it, makes peace between God and man. But Jesus answered, I tell you, when He approached Jerusalem, He saw the city and wept over it. So, this city that was going to kill him, but he drew near. Now, if someone is going to kill us, we will try to harm us first. At least we will take self-defense. But he drew near to that, those people who are going to kill him, and he wept over. So, Jesus' love language had tears also. If you had known, this is what he said, in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now, they have been hidden from your eyes. Now, I want to ask you, are there things inside you that's causing you to lose your peace? And then, what, what are those things that you may be having inside you that's causing you to lose your peace? Here is a list of some of the things. Is there bondage, secret sin, old sorcery? Generational iniquity, unforgiveness, financial fraud, sexual violation, drivenness, stress, weaponizing words, tit for tat, all these things remove peace from inside us. And bondages come into us. And he warned them and said, since if you don't go through what I'm offering you, days will come upon you. Luke 19, 43. When your enemies will throw up a barricade against you, surround you and hem you on every side and they will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. 
Watch out for internal bondage that wall you and separate you from others and the good that God has for you. So internal bondages become external walls that cage you in. Jesus said, know the day he is visiting you. Let it be today. And he is able to make peace. Remove things that are at war inside you. Every hurt, every humiliation, every horror, every hatred, every hex, the five hex syndrome. Instead of the hurt, he gives you healing. Instead of the humiliation, he gives us dignity. Instead of the hatred, he gives us forgiveness. In, 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 instead of horror, fear, he gives us love. And instead of hexes, he gives us his blessing. This is why he said, I will come to you and I will take up my life in you. If you say yes, Lord Jesus will come and see, make become your good shepherd. This is what the Palm Sunday heralded and the young people were so enthusiastic for such a revolution. And Jesus is the first king revolutionary who did not shed anyone else's blood. He shed his blood for the redemption and liberation of the people. Everyone who promises liberation sheds other people's blood. But Jesus Christ, the liberator, gave his own blood. Thank you for listening. I'm Dr. Lars Mendes.